Marriage is a vital building block of society. It's an adventure of love designed to last a lifetime, and it's a celebration of two people starting something new together. We've been running this course for 34 years, and we still get so excited every time we hear a couple say they feel more equipped for the journey of marriage. We want to say a very warm welcome to this course. I'm Nikki. And I'm Scylla. And we're so glad that you've decided to invest in your relationship by coming on this course. Whether you're engaged or exploring marriage, you're on an exciting journey. Scylla and I have been married for 42 years. And as we look back, we can honestly say it's been an exciting journey of discovery. Discovering a lot of things about each other and about ourselves that we didn't know when we first got together as well as discovering what it takes to build a marriage. We met when we were both teenagers. Nikki was 18 and had just left school, and I was 17 and had one more year to go. And we met through a mutual friend and ended up in next door holiday cottages for two weeks in the southwest of Ireland by the sea. And we both fell madly in love. As a result, at the end of the holiday, we started dating. And then four years later, we got married. We have four children who are now all grown up, a daughter Kirsty and three sons, Benj, Barney and Josh. Three of our children are now married themselves. And this pre-marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. And we're going to be hearing from a number of couples from around the world, as well as relationship experts and psychologists on the topics and the issues that we'll be exploring. On the morning of the royal wedding between Prince William and Kate Middleton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said, Marriage is a commitment that says, I'm prepared not only to spend the rest of my life with you, but to spend the rest of my life finding out about you. There's always going to be more of you to discover. Strong marriages don't just develop automatically. Our hope is that you'll discover the attitudes, the values, and the habits that are needed to build a healthy and strong marriage that will last a lifetime. If you start building good habits in your relationship right from the beginning, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in five, 10 or 20 years time. The content of this course is very practical. It's filled with the tools that Scylla and I discovered are important to keep nurturing our love for each other. And as well as getting equipped with these tools, we hope that you'll also have fun finding out things that you didn't previously know about your partner. Occasionally, we'll talk about the difference our own Christian faith makes to us in our marriage. And from time to time, we'll quote from the Bible. But we're confident you'll find everything relevant to you and your relationship, whether or not you have a Christian faith or indeed any religious faith at all. We'll also be telling you stories from our own experience, both the good times and the challenges. Now, sometimes it's only when we get married that we realize some of our deeply held assumptions about life are not universally shared. And that was certainly the case for us. We discovered we had some very different expectations. We want to give you two relatively small examples right now from our own marriage of where our different expectations caused quite a bit of tension between us early on. Uh, the first one had to do with our car. So when we got married, I expected that Nikki would keep our car filled up with fuel. I'd never owned a car and I thought cars were more his thing. But also, I think it was because in my parents' marriage, it was my dad who always filled their car up with fuel. In fact, he never let the fuel gauge in their car go below halfway. Whereas my father thought it was a complete waste of time to fill up any more than he had to. And I also remember him explaining to me that it's cheaper to run a car on the second half of the tank because then the car's lighter. So I find I'm quite happy driving around with the warning light indicating we're nearly empty. Anyway, I think it makes the journey more exciting. Whereas I definitely didn't think it made the journey more exciting. And after quite a lot of stress from me and running out of fuel a few times, I realized I could perfectly well fill the car up myself. The second example of where different assumptions have created some tension over the years is around what happens when things in our house break or stop working. My father was very good at mending things. So when something wasn't working at home, my parents never called a plumber or electrician or whoever. My father would fix it himself. My father, on the other hand, had many gifts, but he was totally impractical. He wouldn't even change a plug. He'd rather get the electrician. So my instinct, if something breaks, is to get a professional round to fix it as soon as possible. And that really upsets me. First, because of how much it'll cost, 
but also because it deprives me of the satisfaction of having a go at trying to mend it myself. Which then really frustrates me, as Nicky just may not have time to look at it for several weeks. We didn't realise why these issues caused so much tension between us until we reflected on the different expectations we'd inherited from our upbringing. Now, of course, there are likely to be much more serious differences to deal with, especially if you come from different cultures. And it'll be a great help for your relationship to be aware of the different expectations and to discuss them early on. And we'll give you plenty of opportunities to do that during this course. Being able to talk openly and honestly about our differences is vital if we're to have a strong marriage. Your upbringing, right? So it sort of affects your outlook on life. Certainly there's like a lot of like cultural differences. How so? How so? Uh, uh, our families, uh, one is in Italy, one is in South Korea. It's a completely uh, yeah, yeah, two different worlds. I don't know, I feel like uh, like a lot of times you're... Uh, Some of our families are very different. Yes, we're very quiet, we're very practical. We're not much fun to be around with. Whereas my family is like a, a drama. I guess like a little bit, um, like a little bit unusual. Okay, so what socially awkward things have I done? <laughs> my family is super foodie and respectful on the table. And yeah. My family is dead opposite of whatever a family is. It was always important for my dad that we should have dinner together every night. So I assumed every household was like that. Man, was I mistaken. <laughs> so now we want to give you an opportunity to have a conversation just between the two of you. We'd like you to take your journals and turn to the first conversation, Different Expectations. See if you can identify one different expectation you have that's the result of your upbringing or different cultural backgrounds. Tell each other what comes to mind. And we've put some ideas in your journal to get you started. Good communication is a foundational and vital aspect of any healthy relationship and it involves both talking effectively and listening effectively. All of us have to learn and go on learning how to be good communicators. And marriage is probably the best training ground, not least because it's the most challenging. One of the most helpful things to recognise at the outset is that we're all different in the way we communicate. And we want to look at two factors in particular that dictate our communication style our personality and our background. So first of all, our personality. We each have a unique and different personality. The Bible describes us all as being remarkably and wonderfully made. And it's worth trying to recognize where each of us comes on a spectrum between different extremes. Some people are more extroverted, and in terms of communication, they may well process their thoughts externally. In other words, they tend to think out loud. Other people are more introverted. They'll probably tend towards organizing their thoughts in their heads first before they speak. Andy's so extroverted, like you just love to chat, you love talking. I'm more introverted, it's kind of like a bit of time to myself. In the mornings, Andy would wake up and just be like, hey, how are you? What did you dream about? Well, I feel like I've had eight hours by myself when I'm asleep, so you just, you want to be around people again, don't you? But it just, it would wind me up. Like, I just felt <laughs> so claustrophobic. I was like, he's like invading my privacy, and now you want to invade my subconscious, like my dreams aren't even my own anymore. We are very different. <laughs> he's an extreme extrovert. I would want to just be by myself, have time to think. He just loves a party. He's very easygoing, go with the flow. I'm extremely good at time management. I'm a very sort of high energy whirlwind of a, pro of a personality. And Tony's way more laid back. So very much that wanting him to have, you know, more plans and more energy and more, you know. And I'm looking at him like, you're on a break. And, and as you can see, Hers is a mile a minute. And I'm like, oh, whoa, yeah. slow your roll, babe. Slow your roll. Back it up He's a little bit. He's always telling me I need to take a nap. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, I don't need no nap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's more outgoing. I'm not, you know, I'm, again, very shy. We're completely opposites. Little things I'm like, you know, you like this food? No, of course not, because I love <laughs> it. But those, we've learned that the things that make us so different are actually our strengths. 
，我是急性子，做什么事情说了立马就去行动的。是，我呢是在做之前，我要花很多时间去思考，之后再去做。比如说，我们说我们两个商量一起来去，嗯、呃，收拾屋子、打扫房间。我说这样，我去收拾卧室，你来收拾客厅。然后十几分钟过去以后，我把卧室已经收拾干净出来了，他还在沙发上想我从哪里开始。Another way people can differ in their communication style is that some people are more analytical; they work things out methodically and may take a long time to make decisions. Well. Other people are more intuitive. They act on hunches and can jump to conclusions, which may well turn out to be right. As the course progresses, you'll probably realize that I tend towards being more analytical and more introverted. Whereas I am more of an extrovert and more intuitive. So that's about as different as you can get. And if Zilla's worried about something, she needs to talk it out as soon as possible. But she may still be in the process of working out what she thinks. So she often says something to me with great passion and conviction. But she's quite likely to change her mind five minutes later and express another view with equal passion and conviction. So I've discovered over the years it's better not to react too quickly. Meanwhile, Nicky likes time and space to sort out an issue in his head first on his own and then tell me what he thinks. At which point I say, "Well, that's not really a discussion. That's just your conclusion." So, as you can see, before we've even started to express our own points of view, our ways of communicating are very different because of our different personalities. Let me give you an example. We were in the car together not long ago, and I thought it was a great opportunity to chat to Nikki about a big family party we were planning in Scotland, where my family live. There were lots of relatives coming of all ages, and as I like processing my thoughts out loud. I wanted him to help me to work out the dynamics of who should sit next to whom at dinner. So I was talking away, hoping for his input and suggestions, but he was very quiet. So after a while, I stopped and asked him what he thought. He looked slightly embarrassed and admitted he hadn't really been listening to what I'd been saying. He told me that he'd been trying to work out in his head how much it was going to cost to get up to Scotland for the party and whether it was cheaper to drive or go on the train. So our different communication styles can be quite frustrating at times for both of us. In the end, I worked out it was going to be cheaper to fly. It's time for another conversation. We've told you about ourselves. Nikki likes to think it out, while I like to talk it out. We want you to turn in your journal to the conversation how we communicate. Now, each of you take a few minutes to tell your partner how you think their personality affects the way they communicate. Do they tend towards being more extroverted or more introverted, more analytical or more intuitive? The second thing that affects our communication is our family background. No two families are the same. Some families are quiet. Other families are much louder. Some families air disagreements immediately. Others delay or avoid talking about conflicting views at all. Some are more volatile. Others are calmer. In some families, where they take it in turns to talk, interrupting is seen as rude. Whereas in another family, talking over each other and interrupting is a sign of interest, and not to interrupt is seen as being bored or unconcerned. Nikki and my families had quite different styles of communication. My family was definitely of the loud variety and could be quite volatile, while Nikki's was rather quieter and calmer. And the most obvious time to see that was at meal times. Yeah, I remember vividly the first time I met Silla's family, and the first meal I had with them was very interesting. <laughs> My family tended to talk at the top of their voices all at once while eating at 100 miles an hour. I, I wasn't used to that. I would put my knife and fork down while I talked, and as I was the new boyfriend, her family was asking me loads of questions. And by the time they'd all finished, I was only on my second mouthful. So we all had to sit and wait for him to finish, which felt like forever. And then my mother offered him a second helping, and I think Nicky wanted to make a good impression to show that he liked my mother's cooking. So he accepted. At which point we were stuck there for at least another 15 minutes, with me thinking, "Oh no, this is a nightmare." My name is William,、uh, and 
I think fun is the number one thing that attracted me to Steph. What first attracted me to William was that he actually he split his food with me. And then as time went on, I think I was just attracted to that sort of giving, selfless person that he is. I think our families are very different. He came from a big family, a very boisterous family, um, a, a high conflict family. I came from a family that was um, only two kids, very quiet. I remember the first time we went to your parents' house mm -hmm. and they're just sitting around talking and talking and talking and the time is just like going on and on. And I love his parents, but goodness gracious, let's go to bed, people. And finally, I called it at, I think it was 11. I said, I'm gonna go to bed. And they all kind of looked at me like, you're going to bed? Yeah, I mean, it's only 11. Story, story, story time's just story started. Story time has just begun. <laughs> and I, now, yeah. I, they know that at like nine o'clock, I say, see you later, everybody. And you, when you would go to my family, mm -hmm. it was like, we only saw you for an hour. So we had yeah. meal together, that was enough time. Yeah, it was like, well, it was good catching up. Now everyone, let's go their separate ways where my family would be like, okay, well, we just had a two hour meal together. Uh, what else go, can we do let's, together? Let's go retire to the living room and just talk some more. We're going to give you a chance now to think about the way your own family communicated as you were growing up. And then you'll be able to look at whether this is different to your partner's experience. Please turn in your journal to the next conversation, Family Styles of Communication. First, mark with an X where you think your own family comes on the lines between the two extremes. Each of you do this on your own and then discuss with your partner what you've put. We want to look now at three hindrances to good communication in a marriage and how we can overcome them. The first and most common hindrance is failing to make time. Perhaps the best investment we can make for our relationship is to set aside time regularly for meaningful conversation. Nikki and I discovered pretty early on in our relationship that this sort of time doesn't just happen. Our experience is that we have to plan it into our lives to make sure that we stay connected with each other. That might mean making time in the morning to connect before we go to work, or in the evening to catch up on our day. And it's involved having regular date nights. The best bit of advice we were given when we were first married and life was incredibly busy was to organize a date once a week. And we've kept this up for over 40 years and it's made a huge difference to our communication. And on session four, we'll talk more about the benefits of date nights in a marriage. Now, planning quality time like this is important. But so too is guarding this time from things that will distract and interrupt us. One of the greatest hindrances to meaningful conversation today is screens, especially our phones. A couple can be physically together but fail to connect with each other emotionally. So now when Scylla and I are having a meal together or having our date night, we put our phones on silent and put them out of sight so that we're not constantly distracted by the interruption of its sounds or notifications. We recognize that making time for meaningful connection is more challenging in certain circumstances. For example, if as a couple you have different working patterns, particularly if one of you has to travel with your work a lot, or if you have small children and it's no longer just the two of you, or perhaps you're going through emotionally challenging circumstances like struggling to start a family or facing an illness or financial or work difficulties. In these situations, communication and connection are all the more important. Take five, marker. One of the pressures that has happened was when my sister died. So she was 26 at the time and um, she had a six-year-old boy and she died very, very suddenly. We then went through a court process to gain parental mm. rights of my nephew, who is our eldest son. Um, but that was a huge strain. It was a defining moment. Yeah. I think we learned to communicate even more during that period. It just changed life, really. But yeah. I think 
that was probably the biggest trial yeah. we've been yeah. through, isn't it? But I think, as I say, having the, the foundation in the early days of communication, mm. I think the payoff is later in life when things like that happen, yeah. is that you've already laid the groundwork yeah. for being able to talk because the groundwork was laid. Yeah. It's, it's not, not, not a bit easy, but it's, yeah. it's a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. When we first got married, and at different points in our marriage, we've had very different schedules. Mm -hmm. So I was working nine to five, Kate was working as an actress, and you were working evenings. And so often I would come home and you'd have been by yourself most of the day. All day. And so you needed to talk to people and I just needed to be like, oh, I just need to be quiet. So there was a time where you'd be getting back from a show at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. and I'd be like, I'm going to sleep. And it is that, mm -hmm. naming it, saying it what it is, and then prioritizing times to talk, like setting that time in. I think working out date night as well, being really flexible on it, so it might have just been a lunch where you'd come in and we'd have lunch together um, at a work time, or, or there would be flexibility in my work, so we would just, just, you know, setting the bar really low during those crazy seasons, but making sure we were doing something. Ah, 然后等上课去了以后，然后呢，啊，我们专门花不出时间，然后来来聊。哪怕吵架，好像也OK的，只要有时间来连接，对，原来最怕的好像好像也不吵，但是有点渐行渐远呢，就关系有点疏远了，因
in a marital relationship, expressing feelings is so important. We use a very、uh, simple phrase in Chinese. We say, "Ah,、uh, uh, 说出来未明白 means、uh, speak, speak out, ask. One speak, another ask. You speak out what you feel, what you think, so that other people would understand you. <laughs> Without concealing it, hiding it, we let ourselves to be like water flowing smoothly. Without accumulating a lot of、uh, pent up emotions, when you feel、um, misunderstood, feel ignored, mistreated, you just ask. When we ask, we would let our Relationship going smoothly, like also like flowing water,、um, because、uh, we do not guess what other people would think about us, would feel about us. I think that's a very good way of communication. We may find it difficult to communicate at the level of our feelings for a number of reasons, perhaps because we feel inadequate or vulnerable. Or we get very defensive or are fearful of how our partner will respond. Or there may be other reasons from our background or personality that mean we find talking at the level of our feelings difficult. But it could just be busyness. We don't allow the time to do so, or hiding our feelings has become habitual, and telling our partner what's going on inside feels foreign and awkward. But we want to encourage you to dare to trust your partner, and to start disclosing your feelings to him or her by saying. I feel excited about whatever it is, or I feel sad, or I couldn't sleep last night because I was worrying about this or that. This is vital for meaningful communication as a couple. And if you know that your partner struggles to express their feelings, it's really important for you to listen without judging or criticizing them, because it may well have taken real courage for them to disclose deep and personal things. We'd like you to turn to the next conversation in your journal called "Effective Talking." Tell your partner how you tend to communicate when you're feeling anxious or cross or under pressure. Are you imitating what you saw as you were growing up? Then ask your partner how difficult or easy it is for them to talk about their inner thoughts, their attitudes, and their emotions, and find out if they were encouraged to talk about their feelings during their upbringing. We want to move on and look at a third hindrance to good communication, which is failing to listen to each other. Listening is of huge importance for building a foundation of understanding and intimacy in marriage. We had no idea about the power of listening at the beginning of our marriage. Relationship counselor Gerard Hughes said, "The gift of being a good listener, a gift which requires constant practice, is perhaps the most healing gift anyone can possess." It doesn't judge or advise the other, but communicates support at a level deeper than words. When someone listens to us, we're likely to feel understood, valued, supported, and loved. It makes us feel good when we know we've been listened to. Whereas, when we're not listened to, we can be left feeling frustrated, ignored, taken for granted, misunderstood, and unloved. Not being listened to is highly damaging to a relationship. But equally, I know from personal experience, being a good listener is difficult, and that's probably because it's costly. It demands our time and our patience, and it may well mean we have to overcome some bad habits that we've got into. And most of us have some bad listening habits to overcome, such as going off on a tangent with a story of our own when our partner is in the middle of their story, or rushing in to give advice when what our partner really needs is our empathy. Or reassuring, which is when we're constantly downplaying any negative feelings that are being expressed, whether that's sadness or anger or disappointment, in order to try to keep everything calm and cheerful. Or the most common of all, interrupting our partner when they're in full flow. 
And speaking as someone who is not a naturally good listener, I find myself all too often falling into at least three of these bad habits. Mark. I would interject with sometimes my own experience or my own something in the middle of what she was saying. Because for me, I'm like, it feels like, oh, I totally understand that, blah, blah, blah. Here's my story. But for her, she's like, you just derailed the conversation and made it about yourself. And then sometimes she'll like make assumptions as to what I'm going to say or mm -hmm. thinking. So I'll like say, yeah, and then I, and then she'll jump in and finish my sentence. And I'm like, no. He definitely brought it up and it's because I would interject or just assume what he was saying. Um, and then so he told me and just was honest. So I've just tried to listen through the whole, like the whole of what he's trying to say mm -hmm. to get to get really get the meaning behind it. I'm an engineer by profession and my job we're always thinking about solving problems and I think that I'm pretty good at it. And I think uh, all of the things that I hear have rational solutions that if implemented that they will go perfectly <laughs> and I have answers for everything. I will say that in my case is uh, interjecting it's just having my like my agenda putting it down and um and not interjecting like letting him finish quite surprising at the things that you learn from the other person when you really listen and be quiet we're both really bad at listening <laughs> we're trying to get better but we're dreadful do you tend to think that you know what i'm saying so you join in and you affirm what i'm saying but i feel like you're interrupting me and then I lose my train of thought. Yeah, I like to, you know, agree and like like nod and like go, oh yeah, I get that. I felt that the other day. Or but Dan needs me to just listen. What I find frustrating is Dan says I interrupt, but I feel you interrupt. So we're basically saying the same thing to each other. I think we both have the same weakness and both find it difficult to see what we're doing wrong. Look at you nodding, smiling as though that's not true. <laughs> mm. This isn't one-sided. We're not we need to get better, I think. We're still working this one out. Yeah. My default is that I'm a reassurer. My tendency is to minimize anything negative that someone else is expressing, as I think it'll keep everything happy and positive. But I've gradually realized it doesn't help if I don't let Scylla or anyone else in the family voice what they're feeling. Most of us have to learn to listen to each other. Some research into typical patterns of conversation revealed that the average individual only listens for 17 seconds before interrupting with their own agenda. Effective listening involves patience, allowing our partner to finish what they want to say. It means putting aside our own agenda and seeking to see the world through our partner's eyes. And it means making the effort to understand them when they think or feel differently to us. We don't learn to listen overnight. It takes lots of practice. But even the worst listeners amongst us can change. I'm Tony Troxler. I'm Susie Troxler, obviously. And we've been married for about what, 12 years now. I'm learning that listening to something, you have to hear the whole thing. You have to get the whole train of thought uh, before you can just answer, not judge, but answer if, you, if an answer is required. I'm Jit, and this is my wife, Karen. And We met in Singapore at the right time, at the right place, and uh, we decided that this was something that we yeah. Um, what we want to do together for the rest of our lives. I do tend to interrupt sometimes. I mean, we grow in a family that takes interest on, on, on everyone, on everything. And, and so sometimes we do, often we do interrupt. Um, and that's just our way of being interested uh, in the subject matter. Um, I realise that there, there are times that we, I just have to keep quiet and not interrupt and just, just listen. We would argue about stuff mm -hmm. and I'd feel like he wasn't listening and stuff, all that in the olden days. The way I know if he understands what I'm talking about is usually by whatever reply he gives me. Even when he's, it just happened not too long ago, even when he, I was talking to him and he was getting ready for work. Not a good time to talk to him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> because his mind, you know, six in the, you know, it's five, it's five o'clock in the morning, he's trying to get out. And I was, I, I knew I was talking to him at a bad time. <laughs> So I wasn't offended by it. But what I thought was so sweet is about two minutes into it, he stops and he goes, I'm sorry, I wasn't really paying attention to what you were saying. And I thought to myself, wow, we come a long way. It's funny how when, when, you, when instead of giving me a, a, an answer, you ask me questions that it just, it's so, it's so life-giving. <laughs>
when he asks questions rather than give answers. Gets better with practice. It helps me when she gives me cues. Uh, so she say something like, Han, I really need you to sit down because I have something to tell you. And then it's like, okay, this is serious. So I will, I'll be very quiet and I can listen. So that's something that we've learned over our years in marriage. In a moment, we're going to get you to practice listening to each other. But first, Scylla and I are going to have a live conversation in front of you to try to demonstrate what effective listening looks like and sounds like. I'm going to tell Scylla something that's been bothering me, and we're going to use a technique called reflective listening. Now, this technique may well appear very contrived, but it will show me that Scylla's listening and that she's seeking to understand me and empathise with me. And I've got no idea what Nikki's going to talk to me about. This is not rehearsed. I'm going to listen and then try to reflect back what he said. That is, to say back to him the heart of what he's told me and particularly any feelings that he's expressed. Now, if I haven't understood properly, he'll tell me again. Then I'm going to ask him, what's concerning you most about what you've just told me? Then I'll listen and reflect back to him again. Then I'm going to ask him, is there anything that you want to do or anything you'd like me or us to do about what you've just said? Then I'll listen and reflect back again. And finally, I'm going to ask him, is there anything else that you'd like to say? And I'll reflect back whatever Nikki says. So for this conversation, I'm the one trying to model effective listening and Nikki's the person with the issue. So, Han, tell me the issue that you wanted to talk about. Uh, I wanted to really go back to what we were talking about earlier, which is our very different communication styles. And uh, let me say straight away, I love the way that you, you're you never short of conversation. I love the way you're so intuitive, so empathetic, the way that you sort of jump into conversations, whether it's with me or with other people. Um, but there are times when I find it difficult, and that's it's when we're having a conversation with somebody else or one or two or more other people. And um, when they're talking, you, you get the gist of what they want to say. It, you actually get there much more quickly than I do. And, uh, and I think that is because you're so intuitive. But then you take over. You say what you think they're going to say. And I think you do it because you want to show them that you understand them. You want to show them that you're with them in this. It's part of your, part of your empathy. But I find it really, really frustrating, at times really irritating actually, because I want to hear what they think or, what the, or their story in their own words. I, I want, actually, I want the details. I don't just want the sort of general sense. And I think sometimes people, uh, you know, they sort of agree with you when you've taken over what they're saying. And I get a bit embarrassed because I think, oh, maybe that wasn't exactly what they wanted to say, but they, they're too polite to sort of correct you or to, or to stop you. Okay, so the issue is around our different communication styles, and yeah. um, we've been talking about that a lot. And um, you said that, obviously, I talk easily, I'm more intuitive, and you love that. Yeah. You know, you, you don't want to say you don't like that. But there are certain... And, and I love that you're never short of conversation. Oh, never short of conversation. Okay, yeah. good. And um, But there is um, particular situations where we're with other people, yeah. either one other person or other people, where actually you find it really difficult because yeah. I come in and you think I do this because I'm kind of trying to um, empathize with them or to kind of help them get the fact that I'm with them and understanding them. But you find that frustrating, irritating and embarrassing because actually what you want is to hear what they've got to say. If they're telling a story, you want to hear it in their words. But you, because I've taken over, sometimes the people feel, yeah. well, they can't say it anymore because I've kind of summarised it. Exactly. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so what's, yeah. what's concerning you most about that whole issue? Yeah. I think at the heart of it is uh, my wanting to hear people say things in their own words, whether it's 
an idea or, or particularly their story. If we're talking to a couple, I want to hear a story about their relationship or about their marriage in their own words. I want to let them, to fin let them finish, even if that takes quite a long time. And I think as well, as I, you know, I, I'm a bit slower at processing the information than you are. So it just takes me, I, I want that time while they're talking, I'm thinking it through and so on before I'm ready to respond. So what it, the, really the heart of it for you is you want to hear what the other people are saying. So if we're talking to a couple, they're telling us about their marriage or something like that, or they're telling a story, you really want to hear it in their words. Yeah their way yes. of telling us, rather than me kind of helping interpreting them, interpreting it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's kind of because partly the, the way we process is different. Yes. And so you, it takes you longer processing and you want to hear from them yes. and then process it and then not have me talking all the time. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. so is there something that um, you'd like to do about this or perhaps I need to do or we can do together? Uh, well, well, I think so. if you could help uh, by letting the, uh, the other person or people or me finish what we want to say, that would help. But I think as well, if we could work out together a sort of signal I could use when, oh, hold on a minute, my darling, because I, I often, I don't want to say that because I think that would be a sort of embarrassing with other people. But if there was a signal that I could give to you, oh, just hang on a bit, just let them finish their story or their idea or whatever it is, and work out some way that we both understand. Okay, so it's, it's um, obviously it's, it's me being more aware of it and, and realizing that when we're in a situation like that, just yeah. knowing that that's what you're thinking, but but having a way in which you could indicate that's not obvious to everybody, but but which we can understand. So if yes. I'm kind of just doing it and not realizing, you can help me to know yes, and remind exactly. me. Yes, and, exactly. And, and let me finish my sentences. <laughs> <laughs> and let you finish yes, your sentences. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to say? No. That is it. Thank you so much for listening, my darling. Um, well done. That's very helpful, <laughs> indeed. Having a conversation like that is always helpful. And don't worry, I'll give Scylla a chance to put her side of the issue when we get home. Now, of course, it's harder to listen when our partner is telling us something about our own behaviour, as we have to do at times in marriage. I can so easily go on the defensive and desperately want to justify myself. And this technique of reflective listening helps me to see the issue from Nikki's point of view. Now it's your turn, and you'll see the instructions in your journal for the conversation called effective listening. And this is an opportunity to take time to listen to each other. So one of you tell your partner something that's important to you or bothering you. And if you're engaged, it may be arrangements for your wedding or something else that you're worried about. And this is a good opportunity to practice expressing your feelings if you're not used to doing so. The other one should listen. And you may need to contain yourself. Then reflect back what your partner says. Resist the urge to come in with your own agenda. Ask the questions in your journal to draw your partner out. Then swap over so you both have an opportunity to talk and to listen. Practicing that type of reflective listening you've just been doing has made a massive difference to Scylla and me over the years, as it has to thousands and thousands of other couples in understanding where each other is coming from. And whatever topic you or your partner address for your conversation, that's not the most important thing about what you've done. Rather, it's about how it made you feel. We hope you felt a greater sense of closeness and a greater sense of shared understanding because communication at this deeper level is what is needed at the heart of every marriage. We've put some continuing conversation starters in your journal that you can do between the sessions. And we'd encourage you to keep practicing that type of reflective listening. It's a very practical tool that you can use over and over again to keep you closely connected. 
And don't worry if it feels quite awkward and seems rather contrived at first. The more you practice, the easier it'll become. We're going to finish now with a reading that you may like to use if you're planning your wedding. Uh, couples often ask us to help them choose a reading from the Bible. So we've compiled a list that you'll find in the back of your journal. And the first one I'm going to read now is from St Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. St Paul describes how we can communicate with God and the effect of talking to him about our deepest concerns and longings. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We'd like to close this session by saying a short prayer for you and for your relationship. So please stay just as you are while I pray. Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we can pour out our concerns to you and you are always listening to us. Please help each person to understand their partner more and more so that their love for each other would grow stronger and deeper day by day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you've joined us and we look forward to you joining us on the next session. <laughs> oh, we're rolling. Okay. Face mask after this. Mm. So we've done the pre-marriage course. I said, done the pre... Why can't I say it? Pre -marriage. The pre-marriage course. <laughs> no, be pre-marriage. You've done the pre-marriage course. <laughs> pre-marriage. <laughs> I'll stop there and you can cut it, can't you? <laughs> yeah, I feel like we haven't started yet. I need to scratch my nose. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but... A gag reel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, my, uh, uh, no.